Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, the region's longest running public affairs program. Legislative Report is a weekly review of activity at the state capitol featuring lawmakers from northeastern Minnesota. Most importantly, it's an opportunity for viewers to call or email their legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, WDSC News and Public Affairs producer, Greg Grell. Well, it's been another busy committee deadline that's in the books this week, leaving lawmakers about six weeks until the end of the legislative session. Today, viewers have an opportunity to find out where local legislators stand on some key issues. You can call the studio with your questions by dialing 218-788-2844 or our toll-free number 1-877-307-8762. You can also email your questions to askmlr at wdsc.org. Now let's introduce the legislators who are joining me in the WDSC studio, starting to my left with Senator Roger Reiner, Democrat from Duluth. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. Representative Eric Simonson, a Democrat also from Duluth. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Representative Mary Murphy, Democrat from Hermantown, is with us again. Thank you, Representative Murphy. You're welcome. And Representative Mike Sundin, a Democrat from ESCO, rounds out our panel today. A great group here, and I appreciate all of you taking the time Welcome. off. Finally, a decent weather day <laughs> right. in northeastern Minnesota. <laughs> and you have us inside. We, we're inside, but hopefully you had a chance to be outside today. Uh, Senator Reinert, let's just start with uh, kind of the intro to the show. We're about halfway through the session, right. but so far only three bills have actually been passed into law and signed by the governor. Is that unusual? Any reason for concern at all? No, not unusual at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think especially so given the split between the parties in the House and the Senate. Um, but as you noted in your introduction, we're really moving along the committee deadline process. Uh, you know, I'd like to share with the public, like that's how the legislature reduces the thousands of bills that get introduced to the ones that will actually move forward. So. Um, no cause for concern. I do think that when we'll probably talk about the really big things are still out there, taxes, transportation, um, and um, uh, bonding. And Representative Simonson, uh, this is a shorter than even usual for the short session because of the uh, construction at the Capitol. Is that putting any extra pressure on lawmakers, do you think, uh, this session? Well, it's been incredibly busy uh, because you still have the same amount of people that want to come down and advocate for what's important to them uh, in a very condensed period of time. So every day has been incredibly busy between committee meetings and floor sessions, just meeting with constituents and, mm -hmm. and different groups that are advocating for different things. So the first, the first half of the session certainly has flown by. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with the second committee deadline behind us, hopefully we'll, we'll focus more on bills that will actually come to the floor and we'll do more of our work on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one thing, and Senator Reiner mentioned it right off the top, and maybe I'll start with Representative Sundin and ask others. Uh, Representative Sundin sits on the Transportation uh, Committee. Uh, there's a lot of agreement from both sides of the aisle that we need to do something about transportation. We need to improve our infrastructure, work on roads and bridges, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of agreement yet how that's going to get done. What's happened so far in your committee? Do you think there's going to be a funding solution for transportation? Yes, there, there will be something, and I'm certain it's going to be in, inadequate in my eyes, but uh, I, I think uh, we were, we're looking at some short-term solutions, just like we did, ended up uh, last year, kind of a lights-on type thing. Uh, I would uh, like to see a, a little more aggressive approach. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of gas tax, a hike in the gas tax to move things along into the future rather than just a one-time fix. Some of my uh, uh, compadres down there are uh, looking at uh, using a lot of the uh, uh, excess uh, or the funding that we have available, the one-time spending, and I'm okay with some of that, but I'd l much rather see a long-term solution to our transportation needs. Mm -hmm. and Senator Reinert, uh, last week we had a viewer who called in and, or actually emailed in a question that we didn't get to, and the question was about the the budget surplus. It's uh, was, you know, it's, Different numbers come out, maybe over a billion, up to $2 billion. Right. And uh, the person was wondering why that money doesn't get turned around and put right into infrastructure rather than new spending. Well, and we should note it's now more about 800 and some million. It's come uh, down. The forecast has brought it down some. And that's the figure the legislature has to use for this mm -hmm. uh, session. And it's important that uh, folks know that there are a couple statutory requirements, uh, essentially, we are required to fill up first the state's checking account and the state's savings account so that we have good fiscal health. And, and many will remember just a couple of years ago, 
as a result of the shutdown, when the state of Minnesota is actually downgraded for poor fiscal management. So those things are actually really important to do, which then leaves a, a really quite a small uh, surplus. And you saw the governor reflect that in his uh, supplemental budget. And I think at least on the Senate side, we'll also be very cautious uh, in any spending increases because those continue on. Uh, and as we learned, there, there's a conference at the start of the session called the One Minnesota that many of us attend. And you know what we learned at that is that we are much closer to the next recession than we are away from it. And so uh, it, it is important to be prudent with that surplus. Representative Murphy, uh, we talked a little bit about the bonding bill last week. Uh, some some uh, groups have come out this week, uh, especially conservative groups, saying that the state shouldn't bond the high number that the governor is calling for saying that the state's capacity for bonding is already at its limit. What's your opinion about the bonding, how important that bill is, and whether we're bonding at too much, there's too many bonds outstanding for the state? Well, the Commissioner of um, Management and Budget, Myron Franz, talked to the Ways and Means Committee and talked to the Finance Committees and said that we really could have a bonding bill uh, as high as $3 billion and still be safe and have another billion dollar one next year. However, that is too fantastic <laughs> <laughs> for almost everybody at this table and, and uh, certainly the governor. And, but the governor th is confident that his uh, 1.3 or 4 billion dollar budget is right on. The Republicans and the conservative groups um, are saying that it shouldn't even be a billion. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the House resolution that was passed by the Ways and Means Committee on Thursday evening said that it can only be the bond bill from the House of Representatives target it can only be as high as 600 million. And therefore, the projects, many of the projects that we were hopeful for with, if, with a billion dollar or more uh, bonding bill, uh, probably won't, won't be in there mm -hmm. for Northeastern Minnesota. That's a selfish way of looking at it. But conservatively, if you're going to look at it, you're going to be talking about um, the basic infrastructure of the public education facilities, higher ed facilities, the DNR um, buildings in the, for the environment, the state buildings across the state, the heaper stuff, the asset preservation stuff. Uh, the roads and bridges that usually are part of the Bonnie Bill, but maybe not more than what are usual. The, a little bit on the logging roads and um, patch and repair for DOT kind of stuff, but not very much um, with new bridges and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So 600 million sounds like a lot, or 600 billion, million is a lot of money but it doesn't meet what the hopes of Northeastern Minnesota are. The Rep. Senator Sundin. Just to emphasize a little bit on what Mary had just uh, <coughs> covered, you don't have to look far for the real needs uh, for some construction projects uh, right here on campus. We've got uh, the Romano gym that's in disrepair that could uh, definitely use some work. Uh, and one project that's a favorite of mine is the WLSSD Energy Project. I think it's a $15 million ask, and uh, that's money well invested if they can uh, produce enough of their own electricity to cover their energy needs down there. That's a savings to all the customers, you know, throughout the uh, WLSSD system. So th that's money well invested. And uh, I guess it would be a good time to remind people that uh, the number that Mary mentioned was $600 million. But uh, the asks that are out there with the nearly 4,000 bills that have been introduced are closer to $4 billion. So uh, I guess we have to pick our fights and uh, work hard on the uh, projects that we choose to prioritize in the region. 
And Representative Sundin, I had a question last week that we didn't have time for, for Gary from Cloquet. It, it applies to the bonding bill. He's wondering if the bonding bill could include additional funding for the Big Lake Area Sanitary System. I'm not going to comment too much, but I'm just going to smile and nod. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> All right. And Senator Reinert? Well, I would just, I think, uh, you know, Representative Murphy and Sandina have, have given a pretty clear picture of where the majority is in the House, but thankfully, that's not where the governor is, nor is it where the Senate is. Uh, you know, we, I think, will put out a bill that is more close, al closely aligned with the governor in terms of size, because as Representative Murphy indicated, the state could bond up to a $3 billion capacity without weakening our fiscal integrity. And as Representative Sundin said, we have $4 billion in unmet needs out there. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, all three parties have to come together, and two of those three think that it should be larger than that. Uh, and uh, our, our colleagues here, I think, are being humble uh, because, you know, they could note that the majority needs their help. Um, to pass this bill in the House. And so I think at the end of the day, we'll probably see something closer to um, a billion than the 600 million that, that's being talked about. All right, uh, we have a call from Jim in Hermantown and Representative Simonson, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, he's wondering if, if the legislators could introduce a loading unloading fee for the port system and the fee could be used to help control invasive species. Is that a state issue or would that be more of a, a federal issue? Uh, since most of those ships are coming across, you know, state boundaries and so on? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. I mean, it's both state and a federal issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's a lot of things happening at the federal level to try to address just that. Uh, but we are, I mean, those are conversations that continue to happen, but you also want to be careful about, you know, how we frame this. But we're working really hard this year, I know, to try to to get some funding for the St. Louis River cleanup. Right? Mm -hmm. The St. Louis River, the St. Louis Bay, St. Louis River Estuary. We want to get some state dollars and this will be tied back to the bonding bill, of course, as always. But um, if, we can, if we can get that bill passed, we can leverage a great amount of federal funds to help us finish that project. But mm -hmm. uh, to that question, you know, the answer is yes, we continue to work on ways to, to try to fund that and try to combat that. And Representative Murphy, Jim also follows up this question that currently citizens pay uh, a fee when they purchase a fishing license that helps control invasive species as well. So he's thinking, you know, it mm. should be spread out a little bit. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I'm not familiar. I was, wish Representative Schultz would be here um, because she's on the Great Lakes Commission. I'm not sure what fees are charged uh, to come down the lakes and mm -hmm. at the various stops that they, they have to make and to go through the Sioux. And so, um, they they had fees when when I was on the Great Lakes Commission, and I'm sure they still exist, but I'm not sure what they are now, and I'm not sure how Duluth is part of that. Okay. Uh, Representative Simonson, you uh, weren't here last week. We talked a little bit about the potential sale of Duluth Central to be used as an Edison Charter School. You have a bill that you're carrying that has to do with charter schools and potential school building uses. Do you want to talk a little bit about that bill, what, it, what it's about? Sure, and we're still in the process of drafting that legislation, and realistically, this is a 2017 project you know, okay. at this point, but I, I wanted to get it out there so that we start having this conversation. But, you know, I, I think this is a unique situation, and you can't compare every potential sale to, to a charter uh, mm -hmm. to this one, but this is unique uh, from a couple of different perspectives. One, the fact that uh, the, the Edison School Program is run by a board of elected folks, but they're elected within their own group, right? They're not elected public officials. And in this particular case, that board voted to spend, uh, or to authorize a purchase, I suppose, in the neighborhood of $14 million to buy this property, which sounds very good uh, if, you're, if you're an ISD 709 person that wants to get this property off of your books mm -hmm. and you want to recoup that, that cash to help you with your budget deficit. Uh, but the reality is that that board is authorizing to spend $14 million of public money. And I think that's what a lot of people don't necessarily understand is that when the Edison School Board, um, who is a privately elected group, votes to spend money, they are going to recoup that money from the state of Minnesota general fund. Mm -hmm. that, that is real. Um, and in this particular case, I, I think that is not necessarily the best way to go about this. And I think, you know, personally, I would like to see charter school boards be elected by, uh, just like the ISD 709 board is from 
the constituents and the voters within their districts that they serve. That's that, that would be one aspect of that bill. Okay. And uh, Senator Reinert, sticking with the education theme, uh, the omnibus higher education policy bill is going to be moving to the Senate floor pretty soon. One of the aspects they're dealing with is the spiraling student debt, the fact that students are coming out of higher ed with such huge debt. I'm not sure how involved you've been with the bill, but maybe you can comment a little bit about that issue and what your thoughts are on higher ed. Well, and they, I haven't, I'm not on that committee, so I haven't been uh, intimately involved. Um, I would like to, to touch maybe after I answer your question on UMD mm -hmm. um, and a connection there. But I think, you know, generally we all know and families and students know that that student debt has really escalated dramatically, especially in the past decade, 12 years. And, and the reason that is, is because of a, a political fight over whether a higher ed degree is a private good or a public good. And in the, the public good model, we the people help support through our state institutions. And in fact, the state of Minnesota has on the books that we will pay two thirds of a degree at a state university or the University of Minnesota. And under Governor Pawlenty, we actually fell all the way down to 48, 47%. We were below half for the first time in the state's history. So, you know, we've been investing and trying to, to bring that back up. And of course, the more we invest in our systems, the less load on students and their families. Um, you know, conversely, if you think that higher ed is a private good, then it is up to you and your family to do that. The only problem from my perspective with that model is you end up with no teachers, no nurses, no social workers, things where your occupation at the end um, does not provide enough income to, to take care of all of that debt. So um, we have continued to try and move forward with, uh, with that, with investing in our public institutions. Um, and I would just tie that to, you know, we have seen some budget challenges here at UMD. And so uh, I was able to add an amendment to the higher ed bill last year in our, our big budget year that asked the university to explain how it budgets internally um, because UMD ends up being in this inner uh, the space in between, the small branch campus, coordinate campuses like Crookston or Morris and uh, the Minneapolis campus. And, and yet it's treated as one budgetary unit like Crookston and Morris are. And so we've actually seen some uh, taking from the less expensive programs, the liberal arts degrees in order to fund the more expensive, the technical and science degrees. So this year, I think, uh, and especially before I leave the legislature, we're gonna continue forward on that. And we're gonna put some pressure on the Minneapolis campus to really justify how it budgets, how the bases are set, and how it needs to treat UMD a little differently. Because with 16,000 students, it's neither a Crookston nor is it a Minneapolis. It's something in between. Representative Sundin. Yeah, the, stu the student debt uh, issue affects probably uh, rural Minnesota more so than the metro area. And uh, here, here's why the, uh, I signed on to a bill uh, last year that authorized $15 million in debt relief for doctors, nurses, chiropractors, not what chiropractors weren't in there originally, but uh, uh, a number of medical professionals and high demand uh, professionals that uh, they're lacking in the outer, uh, outer Minnesota, greater Minnesota. And this is a really good bill that uh, Representative Teese uh, brought forward. And it turned into a Christmas tree. Everybody wanted to uh, throw something on it and okay, this is a good idea. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it got overloaded a little bit, but uh, greater Minnesota is affected more so than uh, the metro area because there's economic opportunity there more so than out, out in greater Minnesota. All right, anybody else want to comment on higher ed at this point? Representative Murphy, I've got a question. Uh, 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 issue actually that's moving forward and that is uh, got some attention this week in the newspaper. Uh, the issue is uh, the five-day waiting period for people who want to get married. And Minnesota and Wisconsin are the only two states that have a waiting period and there's a bill out that would the House I think is going to vote on soon that would eliminate that waiting period. Any thoughts about that? Well I didn't know I didn't know that <laughs> there wasn't a waiting period for all people and since I've never really applied for a marriage license. <laughs> I didn't know. Th <laughs> I've never given it very much thought till I read that article, and I thought, well, why was it? Was the waiting period like at church where they used to issue the bans, and then people could come forth and say, tell things if the about the person if there was some wrongdoing in their past or something. And I think that must be what it is, a holdover from way long ago. And probably in this technological age and so forth, um, 
it probably doesn't make sense and fine with me if there's no waiting period. It does seem like a holdover from another age, although it would uh, probably be a good thing. They should have it in Las Vegas, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I did make a note of it to, to check on that this week because uh, it, it's, it w I was just curious about the whole thing. Right, right. Well, we'll see what happens with that measure, Senator. I, I think, and there's something else in the House that related to marriage. Somebody has a bill that, that lawmakers could, if you're, a, if you're a legislator, you could officiate, right? right. I, Oh I, I think gosh. that's, no. I would like, to, that, that's on my legislative bucket. Captains list. get to do it, right? Right, uh, that's right. <laughs> Justice, Justice of the Peace. So. Representative Sundin, uh, the House Transportation Committee moved forward a bill uh, this week that would improve railroad safety. That's been a big issue the last couple of years. There's been some bad accidents, oil tanker accidents. Uh, talk a little bit about that transportation safety bill, what it might do, and what your thoughts are about it. The transportation safety bill would provide for more inspectors and uh, upgrades. There's actually a number of issues that uh, affect, you know, the, the rails. It could be uh, power lines going uh, over it, uh, uh, pipelines going underneath it. But uh, the main thing is the, is the traffic. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize when you're transporting this uh, bulk and oil through the cities uh, and the byways in Minnesota, when they're parked at a siding and waiting to move on on the track, if there is a spill in one of those towns, that oil gets into the uh, sewer system and it could ignite the whole town. And we've seen that in uh, Lake Magnetique in Quebec, was it? Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago. And it's just a matter of time before we see another disaster, you know, probably of that proportion. And uh, we can do without it. If we can uh, improve the railway safety, uh, the tankers that actually transport the oil, there, as of last year, there were 79,000 of those tankers operating in the United States and 70,000 of them are the older generation, not quite as safe tankers. Mm -hmm. And Burlington Northern is replacing them, um, but it takes quite, a pro quite some time to d get that done. So the railway safety is uh, uh, very important and it's gonna be more important once the oil starts flowing again like it was a, a year, year and a half ago. So. And Senator Reiner, you, say, you serve on uh, transportation and public safety. Right. Uh, what's happening on the Senate side on that issue? Uh, we actually moved on that last week as well. Um, both the additional uh, uh, safety measures as well as more rail inspectors. The mm -hmm. state of Minnesota up until a few years ago only had two to cover the entire state of Minnesota. So uh, at least on the Senate side, we're going to double that to four, <laughs> which still is inadequate. Um, I think Representative Sundin really, you know, uh, highlighted an important issue. What if in Callaway, northwestern Minnesota, um, that had been an oil train hitting a propane trunk? We, we would have in Minnesota had what happened in, in Quebec. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I've worked really hard on uh, trying to get a fire safety, uh, trying to get the fire safety center at Lake Superior College uh, geared up to deal with shipments of oil, whether they be rail or pipeline. You know, we in Duluth already have a center that deals with fire. Our firefighters do training there. Uh, it, it deals with aviation fires as well. Mm -hmm. So for um, a partnership investment between the state and those who make money on this, the, the pipelines and the uh, train companies, we could have that here uh, in Duluth. You know, the reality is our, our first responders around the state of Minnesota, uh, paramedics, EMTs, firefighters, police, uh, even medical professionals are gonna rush to these scenes without any training, uh, and I feel strongly we have a moral obligation to, to do that. And Representative Simonson, you're probably uniquely qualified to talk about that lack of training, being a, that you are a firefighter. Uh, talk a little bit about, has there been training, uh, at least locally, for a, a rail accident that would involve an oil tanker? You know, I would say that over the last couple of years, there's been an increased awareness mm -hmm. of the need for training. Mm -hmm. I won't go so far as to say that there's been an influx of really good, positive training, but I think that by and large, everyone is talking about it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it's initiatives like Senator Reinhardt's that he's talking about that really kind of get the ball moving in the right direction. Because if you don't encourage uh, you know, the pipeline companies or the rail companies to do something, they're often not going to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And it's been frustrating even just to get emergency plans from them, you know, get data from them that we can incorporate into our plans. Right. Um, but it, we're moving in a direction, but there's a long ways to go. And we talked about that a little bit last week. Apparently, because of the federal rules, a lot of times the railroads don't think they have to talk to the state because they're going under the federal rules. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe that's something we need to deal with. Uh, 
Representative Sandin. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, the, the firefighting situation, a lot of the uh, volunteer fire departments throughout the state, they're uh, really hurting as far as uh, maintaining some of their members because uh, they, they just can't incentivize uh, that participation in those communities. So anything we can do as a legislature, you know, boosting their pension funds or whatever we can do to uh, enhance the training and uh, and have a better retention of those firefighters that would benefit the state. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do a little public good right now, Representative Sundin. Talk a little bit about volunteer firefighters. Are they compensated for what they do? How does that work? Maybe somebody out there has been considering it would like to know. There's a reason they call them volunteers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there, there is some uh, pension funds available for them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Representative Simonson could probably uh, fill us in on that a little better. Yeah, so each one is different, right? Each one is structured a little bit differently. Some mm -hmm. of them have, uh, you know, there's different variations of pension funds, but most of them, and I, and I won't say all, but many of them have a, a scenario where is if you put in 20 years of service, you'll get a very small, mm -hmm. and it's very small pension in, in return for that. But many of them work for, I mean, zero wages. You get mm -hmm. down around the metro area and some of the suburban departments down there that utilize quote unquote volunteers, they'll pay them a small stipend wage mm -hmm. per hour. But the the numbers of people that are having the ability to even dedicate the time necessary are dwindling and it's it's becoming more and more of an issue for some of these smaller towns. And the the training um, expectations for the training and how far they have to travel for various kinds of training um, to other training centers than the local. Uh, means more time away from home and more time away from the family and so some people say well that's it and we if we keep adding hours for something and uh, new things and uh, they think I can't I can't do any more time than i am already been doing and so they think about dropping out mm -hmm. and then all that training is wasted in the sense that they're no longer a volunteer. So we want to keep them. The representative is absolutely right. Once we've got them, we want to keep them, but there has to be more incentives to get them in the first place. That's right. Well, you are watching Minnesota Legislative Report, and uh, this is your opportunity to call in with a question to our lawmakers here on the panel this afternoon. And Representative Simonson, this might be a good time for this question. Brent from Duluth uh, has a question. I'm going to start out by stating that our lawmakers are part-time officials. You guys don't, aren't full-time employees of the state. But Brent wants to know, Representative Simonson, is it possible to fulfill your duties as a fireman and as a state representative? Well, it must be because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. So the answer is yes. And, you know, most legislators have uh, jobs. Right. I mean, there's, there's a percentage of them that are retired and that are not working. But I would say, by and large, most legislators do have jobs. And it's finding that, uh, you know, that ability to balance. Um, and myself, I use a combination of all my vacation time, all my personal leave time, and then any other leave time that I need to take uh, mm -hmm. is unpaid leave. But I do find that ability to do that uh, in order to fulfill my duties at the legislature. It's not always easy, but it, it's something that you can do. And maybe we can go right down the row. I know, Senator Reiner, you have a job as right. well, and some people take a leave of absence during the session. Uh, right. Talk a little bit about how you do it. Yeah, so, sure. So I, I think Representative Simonson really makes an important point, and you did too. We're part-time. Mm -hmm. um, if you are sort of mid-career, you have to have another job if you have a family. So for my eight years, I've uh, taught at Lake Superior College fall semester and then not taught in the spring semester. Mm -hmm. so. And Representative Murphy, you were a longtime educator as well as a law lawmaker. For 20 years, I uh, was a part-time teacher and a part-time legislator. Mm -hmm. I taught um, full-time in the fall semester. And mm -hmm. that meant, though, that when there were meetings, I did not go to them mm -hmm. because I was Com teaching committee, and committee I wasn't, going to, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. going to take that away from the children. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an understood mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and so some people thought, well, she's not doing her job as a legislator so much. But the, the most troubling part of those years were during the campaign season. Not only were, were we mm -hmm. a legislator and was I a teacher, but then I was campaigning mm -hmm. while I was teaching. And 
that meant very little sleep because <laughs> <laughs> when you're campaigning, you didn't, I did not want to cheat the kids in any way. And so I made sure the papers were back the next day and the tests were prepared and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, because I didn't want anyone calling me out for, mm -hmm. oh, she's so busy campaigning. Sure. It worked out and there are people that are making their jobs work out. There's some people that go to their jobs every day, uh, the ones that live in the metro area. They go to their jobs every day at eight o'clock at night and work till midnight or whatever it is that they can do or what arrangements they've made with their partners or their attorneys or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a part-time job. Rep. Sundin, it sounds like a uh, sacrifice is involved if you want to be a state lawmaker. Absolutely, absolutely. I work, uh, my regular job is a consultant for a labor union and it's uh, very rewarding work when we put uh, people into training programs and, and uh, get them into a real life situation where they can make a decent living. But uh, I have to walk away from that while I'm in session and I sever all, t all my ties with that organization. I hand in my telephone, my uh, laptop and all the equipment uh, so there's no conflict of interest going on ever. But uh, I do take a beating on my pension but uh, if you're going to be a legislator, you have to want to be there, and I want to be there. So Now, Senator Reiner, you've made the decision that this is going to be your last session, right. and you've talked before about uh, a lot of people not thinking that it, it's worth it anymore to, to be a state representative or any kind of elected official. Do you think that the state needs to come up with some solutions to keep good people where we need I mean, them? I think we have to start with the premise that what legislators in Minnesota get paid has not changed since 1992. 1994, the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. You know, and we in the Senate took a vote two years ago, um, and you would have thought the sky had fallen based on the emails and phone calls I got. And the one that really stuck in my mind was somebody who was very upset that we had voted on it. And I think it was taking it from the 31 that we uh, get now to 41. Um, and that's 41,000. Right, per, exactly. Per year. Okay. Um, and, the, and, you know, the, where the, the call ended was. Uh, you know, I said to the individual, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm sorry you're disappointed that I voted for this. It, there is an election coming up. You know, for $100, you can be on the ballot. Uh, and that person said, I would, you couldn't pay me enough to do the job. There you go. <laughs> and That's I, ironic. You know, and I thought, so you're, you're <laughs> upset that, that the legislators might get paid more for something you would never do. Um, and I think that is, at some point, Minnesota has to confront that. Um, you know, if you keep it where it is for another decade and start to push out to 40, even 50 years, the people, especially from greater Minnesota that can afford to do it, become a much, much smaller um, universe. You know, and that wasn't all of my decision to leave, but it was certainly part of it. At 45 with a family, I had to start to think, you know, what is it that I can do best? Uh, and, and I was fine, because I never intended to do this forever. Mm -hmm. um, but it is limiting in terms of who decides to run. And that's a reality that we just need to think about as Minnesotans. Anybody else want to comment on this issue before we move on? Uh, Representative, Representative Murphy, I'll, I'll start with you on this one, but others might have, have uh, want to uh, answer. But Therese from Duluth is wondering, why doesn't the state advocate specific money to schools? I'm assuming she means K through 12 schools to support mental health programs. Do you think that would be a, a good policy for the state to have, Representative Murphy? I think the state should have it, the city should have it, the county should have it, everyone should have it. And most importantly, I think we should be encouraging more people uh, that are in uh, thinking of higher education to go into the fields mm -hmm. that where the needs are for um, dealing with many problems that are growing uh, in our area and throughout the state of Minnesota and through the nation. Um, I think that we should advocate programs that would initi give initiatives for people to go into psychology and uh, health care fields so that we could address it and there would be enough competent people so people wouldn't have to wait and wait and wait mm -hmm. um, to be served. I think it is something that we have to do together with the local uh, 
people that are in the healthcare industry at the present time, and we have to have a long-term plan for how we're going to deal with it in the future, and we don't have that master plan. Mm -hmm. But most counties seem to be addressing it, as in the Arrowhead region anyway, mm -hmm. um, to make it better. Uh, they have solutions um, uh, in our area to talk to each other if they have a problem placing somebody for a period of time. Um, so we don't have to take them to me the metro area or to North Dakota. But so many people of our beds are being taken up by people from other parts of the state that now when northeastern Minnesota has a problem, they are looking at Wisconsin and North Dakota. And so, yes, You're, the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Representative Sundin, uh, even a bigger issue in rural areas, do you think? There, there, this is quite a universe uh, you could look at here uh, as far as the mental health and there's so many things that affect it, uh, you know, the, the drugs, the uh, pressure on young people, I was fortunate enough a couple of years ago to carry the Text for Life uh, bill that financed um, the suicide prevention via texting, and it's been a very successful program. You know, it's grown and met the needs of uh, the youth in, uh, throughout the state now. So, but uh, the bigger picture is the way we treat uh, criminals uh, that are in for uh, drug use, that type of thing. And uh, Mary's 100% correct in the need for more counseling the, um, and uh, rehabilitative services throughout the state. And we need to start treating these people that are addicted to one chemical or another as patients that can recover and be productive again, rather than warehousing them in jails and tying up our hospital beds. It's, uh, it's a disgrace that uh, we're thinking of them as hardened criminals and throwing them away when we could be fixing that. And we have been getting some calls uh, uh, about uh, Minnesota care. Uh, we don't have Representative Schultz here this week who serves on health, but one of the questions uh, Tim from Duluth has is, has there been any progress made in protecting estates of people who are on uh, medical, medical aid? I think that issue came up. Uh, it's not just Minnesota care, but, but it is an issue that ties into that. And Representative Murphy, we talked about that. Has there been any progress on we that? Oh, the House is making progress on that, and the Senate is making progress on that. So I really expect that it will be taken care of before the set, May 23rd. Senator Ryan, yeah. you want to talk about it a little bit more? I mean, I'm not on Health and Human Services, but I know You've that... You've probably heard about it. I, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, there was a great article that I think really brought everyone's attention to it. And, in fact, I have an aunt and uncle who found themselves in that very same situation. So uh, I did talk with uh, Senator Tony Laurie, Chair Laurie, uh, about the issue... Uh, I think Representative Murphy is accurate. We're making progress on it. I do think it will get resolved yet this session. You know, the big takeaway from that is people should make informed decisions. And if someone uh, wants to go that route, they need to know that that uh, potential is there. And I think that was the big miss. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think also, and this is the aspect I don't know uh, will get done this session, but uh, I personally feel if someone doesn't want to put that estate at risk, they ought to be able to say, hey, I'm willing to pay more for one of the other plans. So, um, but I think we will get at least that one aspect resolved this session. All right, uh, Representative Simonson, we have a call from Bob and Hibby, and it's a tax-related call, so I'll let you uh, nice. answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't the legislators put a nickel tax on gas for funding for veterans? Veterans services, I'm assuming, uh, veteran, uh, and obviously any kind of a tax is always controversial in Minnesota, but has there been any movement at all for uh, helping veterans with a new tax? Did he say nickel tax on gas? He said a nickel tax on, ga tax on gas specifically. Oh. Yep. Well, <clears throat> first of all, a nickel tax on gas for any purpose is controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, as we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, not I think with myself, but uh, that's controversial. But that aside, I think that there's uh, always an increased interest in funding for veterans. And, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, you know, this session, I've had a number of conversations with different groups about you know, how do we go about this and what, what is kind of the, the best approach to take? Because 
for example, there's, there's the group that says, well, we should not tax any you know, veterans' pensions at all. And then there's the other group that looks at it from a little bit different perspective and says, well, wait a minute, you know, some of these folks are making over $100,000 a year on their pensions. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can afford to pay some tax, right? So there's some place in the middle, but I, I think that you're gonna see uh, increased discussions going forward about you know, funding veterans' issues, not just that particular one, but I, I don't think that a gas tax uh, to fund veterans is the best way, but I do think we need to better fund our veterans' programs, absolutely. Representative Sundin? The five cent gas tax, I already weighed in on that, but uh, any gas tax is dedicated to trunk highway funds, and those uh, we have to keep that clean. Uh, we can help the veterans in other ways, thank you very much, but uh, the gas tax is for roads and roads only. Roads and bridges. And Senator Reiner, you sit on taxes, the taxes sure. committee in the Senate. Anything at all going on with uh, taxation for veterans affairs? No, not, not related to veterans. And what I would say, I mean, as a service member who will be a veteran uh, at some point, I think Minnesota, and I think Representative Simonson said this, I think we do a pretty good job of putting um, veterans as well as uh, our police and fire uh, folks at a, a high priority. Where we much need to do a much, much better job um, is on unemployment and retraining uh, and on mental health, which we touched on. You know, when you look at unemployment figures and you look at uh, mental health and homeless figure, homelessness figures, veterans are disproportionately represented by multiples. And so, you know, those are areas where we're not going to say let's target specifically veterans, but I think we need to do a better job generally. And when we do a better job generally, we will uh, touch many veterans that are struggling. All but, right, Representative Murphy. And uh, I would like to say this, though, that we have many programs, state programs, that help veterans, but it is really the federal government's responsibility to follow the veterans after they leave service and come back home with programs and funding and accessibility to the veteran service places that they can go to seek help. And it is something that we often have to remind our representatives in Congress and in the United States Senate that there needs to be more money, federal money, for those local programs. You know, I think I've seen in articles before that Minnesota doesn't get nearly the return on its federal tax dollars that many other states do, that we rank very low. Is there anything that the state legislature can do to, meaning that the money that we send to the federal government, we do not get 100% of that back. Is there any way that that can be changed, Representative Sunday? I'll weigh in on, the, on that first. Uh, I think it's close to half of the federal budget's uh, dedicated to uh, the military in one form or another, you're contracting out, whatever. And you take a look at the uh, the coastline, east coast, west coast, south coast, uh, we have military installations all, all the way around there. So that would uh, weigh in heavily to benefit those states that have those uh, ports there. And uh, I think you have to keep that in mind, uh, mm -hmm. where that money is being spent. Is that an issue, Senator Reinert, though? Is that an issue that lawmakers talk about is why aren't we getting the same bang for our federal tax dollars as other states are? Um, not in a big chunk of time. Mm -hmm. um, I, you are right, Minnesota is a net giver versus a, a net receiver. Um, and I think sometimes it becomes a point of frustration when we're trying to do things that are proactive mm -hmm. and we want to be sort of at the leading edge of something and it might involve a federal state partnership and mm -hmm. the feds seem pretty tight uh, mm -hmm. on their budget and their purse strings. And then you look at other states that maybe it, it, we might at this table feel are not being as progressive about uh, some issues and, and have much more federal dollars to work with. I think that's when you really see it come to the forefront. And to, you know, specific, specifically to your question, there isn't a lot that we could do as a legislature. I think the governor can be very effective and has shown to be very effective, especially in emergency responses like the flood in Duluth in 2012 and sort of shaking that federal money tree and, and finding a, a few more dollars to come to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Sundin, uh, we have a question from Larry in Hermantown specifically about the gas tax. Uh, he's wondering at 42 cents a gallon for the gas tax and about six other revenue interests pertaining to roads and bridges, First, he wonders how many millions is brought in a day and why isn't that enough to fix roads and bridges? I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I, I do have a number that uh, Minnesota uh, has the fifth 
largest amount of roads that we maintain in the United States and for a state per, per mile this yeah th well per throughout the, the United most? States so the, yeah the fifth uh, largest uh, amount of trunk highways that the state okay. maintains and uh, to maintain a road in Minnesota you're talking about dealing with frost heaving that type of natural destruction uh, for those roads that you don't see in other other states so is it expensive to do business in a uh, climate such as Minnesota? Yes, it is. And if you take a look at our road system, uh, it's deteriorating right now, but it's a heck of a lot better than most states. I just read that the state of California has the worst roads. I think a lot of Minnesotans would say, that's not possible, Senator Reinhardt. <laughs> it depends on the part of Minnesota you live in, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, to represent, represent Sandine's point, you look at the northern tier of states, it's only a couple states that also have a sizable population. And so Minnesota falls into that maybe unfortunate sweet spot. And now take it even further and let's go to northeastern Minnesota. You know, when we look at the MnDOT transportation districts, you know, the one that covers the most miles um, uh, and has some of the largest needs is our district uh, headquartered here in, in Duluth. So, um, you know, there is significant funding going in transportation. But, you know, for the viewer, you have to keep in mind that I think, and, and uh, um, Representative Sundin can help me out with this, but I think our unmet need right now stands over the next 10 years at almost $7 billion with a B dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the, uh, there's a couple of factors that are really important to think about in there. One is that vehicles are driving more miles. We want more fuel efficient vehicles. So that makes mm -hmm. the per gallon gas tax become a dwindling source of revenue if you keep it static. The other thing is, uh, under Governor um, Ventura, we really leveled uh, vehicle registration, which was another significant source of revenue. So as expenses uh, have gone up, we have chosen revenue sources that either have stayed flat or actually declined. And so you get these arrows moving in a not great direction. And Representative Simonson, uh, as a member of the tax committee, is there talk about these issues and what we can do to, as Representative uh, or Senator Reinhardt said, you know, we're more fuel efficient vehicles mean people aren't buying as much gas. Maybe we're not getting the same revenue uh, from the gas tax. Is there a solution out there that uh, you're talking about? You have to keep in mind who's in charge of the tax committee in the House right now. Uh, those are not really conversations that we have because uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, frankly, there's no appetite on the GOP side for a gasoline tax of any kind. Um, their entire solution is about taking money out of the general fund, which leaves holes and gaps for other programs that mm -hmm. need to be funded. And quite frankly, they're short-sighted solutions to begin with. So um, I don't foresee a solution coming out this year out of our tax committee for sure. Uh, but I think, again, we keep saying this, but going forward into the next biennium, this, this has to be at the top of the list of issues that need to be solved. We cannot keep kicking this can down the road and we'll just wait for something magical to happen because that's not uh, going to happen. And Representative Sundin and then maybe Senator Reinhardt, is there any appetite in Minnesota for uh, toll roads? Some states have toll roads and that's how they keep their roads in good shape. The Constitution of the state of Minnesota, I think outlines two responsibilities. That's an equitable education system and roads for commerce. I think we should live up to that uh, without involving private industry, period. But not on my watch, and granted that watch is short, um, <laughs> but I think that these are public assets and they're public uh, infrastructures. I do want to say, just as long as we're on uh, this point, because I serve on taxes as well, mm -hmm. two things I think are very concerning. One is the idea that we would take existing revenues and divert them somewhere else. Um, you know, that may sound nice in a talking point at a press conference, but what people need to understand is that leaves a huge gap somewhere else. And in Minnesota, that somewhere else is either healthcare or education. That's what we spend most of our general fund money on. The other thing that I'm very concerned about uh, as we move forward over the remaining six weeks is that a bonding bill essentially become just a transportation bill. Um, and that one time money is spent on roads and bridges uh, and then all these other projects that we talked about earlier in the show don't get done at all. So. Um, you know, we've got some different factors that are moving, um, but we need to be vigilant about how those uh, solutions are solved. And if transportation were easy, it would have gotten done last year. Last year was the budget year, and that's when it should have been done. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, as others have said, it may not get done this year. Uh, and that, that should be concerning to Minnesotans. All right. Uh, Representative Murphy, uh, we don't have anybody that s serves on a K through 12 committee, but I know the omnibus K through 12 funding bill is taking shape. Uh, have you heard much about uh, what might happen this year with uh, uh, K through 12 education funding or policy? Sure. 
<laughs> Not much. <laughs> um, we've had hearings, lots of hearings. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting one just two days ago uh, about teaching early learners to sing on pitch <laughs> and their ability to achieve reading level mm -hmm. is incredibly faster if with just 30 minutes, three times a week, of teaching these kids to sing songs on pitch, they've, in three months' time, they've brought up their reading levels. It was an amazing uh, conversation that the music teacher brought to us and uh, was asking for a little bit of investment money for pilot project. Um, however, the targets came out, as I said earlier in this program, is the targets came out on Friday for the House of Representatives, and the amount of money that K through 12 finance got, or pre-K through 12th grade finance, higher education, and you know, health and human services the amounts of their targets are zero. Mm -hmm. So if there's any new spending to go on, it has to come from somewhere within the budget that we approved last spring. Mm -hmm. um, there is a possibility that 52 million would be a, made available by um, 11 school districts, six out of 11 school districts that could change their debt reliefs, and um, we could perhaps, if there's six of those school districts change um, their methods, we could recapture maybe $50 million, and then that could be spent by the K-12 Finance Committee. But um, there's no sure, that's not a sure thing at this point in time. Okay. So also I know that um, you know, the governor has a proposal out there for preschool. Mm -hmm. um, there are other competing uh, entities that want money for preschool scholarships and not tied to licensed teaching, teachers teaching those preschool kids, but community-based preschool things. So that's going to have to come, that decision is going to be made from whatever is going to be proposed. I understand the K through 12 finance bill will be presented on Tuesday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Representative Sandin? Out of that potential $50 million savings, there's seven million of it uh, dedicated to broadband internet connections for schools, but that's also counted as new money for broadband in the uh, Republican uh, budgets. So there's a, there's a few gimmicks going on with that money as well. So uh, stay tuned. All right, we got a question from Ed by email. Uh, he wants to know uh, from each of the lawmakers, so I'll just start with Representative Sundin. Do legislators oppose or support the polymet de development? That's the non-ferrous mining development uh, in northeastern Minnesota. I've come out in support of that uh, due to the uh, uh, faith that I have in the departments that have done the research. I said from day one, follow the science. If the science says it's good, let's go with the project. If the science says it's bad, it, let's not do it. Uh, a lot of people attack the uh, agencies from time to time, but I'll refer to the EPA's decision up at the Penny Mine in Alaska, which is a similar project, only a larger scale. The EPA examined it just like they did the PolyMet Mine proposal, and, uh, and they said, no, you're not going to do it. So uh, let's put our faith in the science and listen carefully to them, because I'm not an expert. Representative Murphy? Well, I don't know that there's any legislation for polymet uh, before us at this time. Um, one of the things that I've carefully listened to is the, uh, with Representative Sandin, uh, talk, follow the science, he's saying. Natural Resource Research Institute has been working on many aspects of the polymet pr project, and we've always been a supporter of the NRI, and that's one of the reasons we brought them to northeastern Minnesota is to help us plan for future economic um, situations in northeastern Minnesota. 
But I've asked questions of people that have come to me about this and about the, economy, uh, the economics of the capital. Mm -hmm. um, is there enough capital um, in wherever they're getting the money from for Polymet right. to start this mine at this time? And most of all, I want to make sure the assurances are there mm -hmm. for uh, that the state is demanding uh, and set, and that was in their EIS also, the financial assurances for cleanup and for the, after the 20 years are up, mm -hmm. what uh, financial burden the state will have to face. Right. And I want that money covered before we put the, the shovel in the ground, so to speak. Representative Simonson, uh, we only have about 30 seconds left. Uh, are you a supporter of the Polymet Project? It's incredibly difficult to answer in 30 seconds. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I'll have to tell you that personally, I don't agree with it. However, I'm willing to follow the process and current law. And as long as we never roll back any of our current uh, regulations and standards, it's in current law. And Senator I, I thought it was important to have a cautious approach. So we haven't touched on anything, I think, in three years. Uh, but I strongly supported the assurance bond and also not making any shortcuts in the uh, process to the permitting decision. Well, I want to thank each of you for taking uh, time out of your Sunday afternoon, uh, especially during a busy legislative session. Thank you very much. And thanks again to everybody who joined us today and everyone who called or emailed in questions. Make sure to tune in again next week for the latest from the state capitol. Until then, I'm Greg Grell. Thanks for watching and have a great evening.